All right, everybody, I hope everyone gets a chance to speak with Tanner. He ran out of here at the end, but I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions. And our next speaker, I would love to be in his shoes and have the experiences and meet the people and know the people that he has. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, let's put it together for our next speaker. And that is gonna be Hamid Kohan. And what we're gonna speak about is how to scale up your stupid law firm. Good luck. Oops. Hello, everyone. I'm sure everybody's very tired listening to everything all day long and all the smart comments and the smart recommendations that was made that was pretty much justified the title of this book because you must feel sort of your firm being not as smart as everybody expected to be. So <clears throat> there's a little story about how this title came about. I started this career after spending about 22 years in Silicon Valley and developing companies and technologies. When I started doing some consulting and uh, uh, management consulting and operation consulting, uh, <clears throat> I was interviewing a lot of law firm owners and as soon as they open up, they start referring to a lot of the areas within their practice as being the stupid part. So my stupid intake, my stupid marketing, my stupid lead generation, so that sort of resonates with me when <clears throat> I started actually putting stuff in writing. The most common term was the stupid part of things. So that's why I used this, this title for doing that. Um, <clears throat> let's see if the remote works. I don't think the remote is working. Oh, here it goes. So, uh, as, as I mentioned, I spent about 22 years in Silicon Valley, was part of several IPOs, developing a lot of technologies and saw a lot of revolutions about technology revolutions, the internet, the dot-com era, and then everything else after that, the mobile apps and the smartphones and so forth. So I developed uh, <coughs> expertise to be able to uh, scale a law firm utilizing a lot of technologies and uh, breaking through, you know, uh, a lot of the barriers within the technology. One of the things that I faced while I was doing a lot of the consulting was the staffing was the biggest part and biggest challenge of any law firm to be able to scale. And <clears throat> the most common questions when they were using the virtual staffing from the other countries was, is it safe? Is it relevant? Can they work our time? How is the accent and all of that? And these are the, um, areas that we overcome to be able to provide a lot of virtual staffing through a lot of different practices. <clears throat> so what we learned today from all this speaking that was I actually had to update this presentation to make it more relevant to what happened today between all the speaking that happened. And the big portion was the AI in law, which will cover a summarizing everything that was heard today. Uh, growing your people, growing your firm, uh, scaling up your firm in the marketing and lead generation and so forth. Uh, personal injury marketing, very specific to personal injury and chat GPD that we just finished talking. So uh, I will cover what's the summary of all of this uh, session was and what we take away from it. So we have a three type of practices that we traditionally started working with. For the traditional law firm, which you, most of firms here was established based on that, to having the local staff, same processes, some with the software, some without a, without a software or a process, or any formal marketing or lead generation or case generation process, that's your traditional law firm. In the past few years, one thing that LegalSoft has been able to do is moving from traditional to virtual law firm. And you've been hearing that on social media and a lot of conferences, everything virtual. So we sort of, uh, I would say, invented the process of going virtual for the law firms, which initially was very challenging, telling people to work or hand cases to people who are overseas and be able to train them, trust them, and expect them to produce results. So the virtual staffing came about, and then virtual marketing, virtual case generation, all of that became to the virtual law firm, which is a sort of a combination of your local team, which is not as scalable as much as it used to be, and then 
adding virtual services and virtual staff to it to make it as virtual a practice as you can. The next thing that we're gonna experience, as everybody talked about today, is the AI law firm. So it takes the virtual to a whole new level. Not only we're we not replacing the existing staff, now we are essentially gonna be either scaling from a virtual staff or even replace some of those tasks with the AI law firm. AI law firm is gonna utilize AI for all aspects of the practice. From the intake, I know some of it was covered today, but I think what it was covered was the intake process or the content generation and the chat GPD being it. Chat GPD is equivalent of the first version of Google for a search, and that's what's gonna remain right now. Every other application development who's gonna sit on top of the open AI is going to be very vertical. Is comparison of the Amazon, which is an e-commerce site, that is basically is an offshoot of you know, Google search or internet. So there's gonna be a lot of vertical development that makes the AI law firm possible. <clears throat> Everything from lead generation, to marketing, to handling customer service, to even scheduling treatment, following up with treatments, collecting medical records, analyzing the medical records, creating a demand, the whole series is gonna be covered by several or a few web development that sits on the top of OpenAI and ChatGPD and everything else like it. So as I mentioned about uh, the virtual staffing, <clears throat> Being able to place virtual staff within the law firm in the areas that are repeatable areas like intake, like document collection, like setting up treatments, all of that is going to be part of the virtual staffing change. Uh, how many people here have actually virtual staff at the, at the practice? It's a good amount of numbers. I think in a couple of years, there's gonna be a lot more hands up because it's becoming so challenging to hire local staff. Digital marketing that we talk about, uh, several people today have talked about that, so I'm not gonna bore you with that. Technology and automation, the entire process of any of these practices now moving to complete automation. It used to be, if you have, you're moving from a standard wired phone lines to voice over IP for your communication, that was a big thing. Now nobody even thinks about it. But everything else in between is gonna be automated through the technology and the client retention. This is something <clears throat> that a lot of the law firms take for granted, is like how to bring back the uh, clients that you served before and getting referrals from them, from friends and family, and bring them back systematically, not just sort of wishing for it, actually doing something about it. <clears throat> so the challenges within the uh, staffing locally, every time we engage with a new law firm, the first thing they ask us is, can you help us get a staff? Because that seems to be the limitation for the growth. So finding qualified, committed, and affordable staff locally is the number one challenge that we notice working with the law firms nationwide. It doesn't matter, almost doesn't matter which state and which city they're at, this is the challenge they have. <clears throat> so we have uh, essentially implemented the virtual staffing in the law firms. So to be able to manage a virtual staff within the law firm is very uh, tricky because you have to change the way that you're used to doing this because they're not sitting next door in the office and so forth, you can call them in anytime you want and so forth. Even though the technology is there to do that, but being able to identify a specific roles for them and keeping them accountable to that is a key thing. So we actually, when we set up a virtual staff to be placed in the law firm, let's say it's a personal injury intake, <clears throat> we give them a specific task. These are dedicated full-time intake staff who are trained in the PI intake, and most often they're also trained on the case management software you use, like Filewine or Clio or Casepeer. So they know specifically within these hours they need to be available to retain clients for the firm all the way to actually sending a retainer out and getting a retainer back in. Uh, <clears throat> when you're managing the virtual staff, it's also a little different than local staff because you're giving them a specific deliverables 
times and availability to be able to collect everything from them on a daily basis. So like <clears throat> we have more, over a thousand VAs placed in a, more than about 600 law firms. Every single one of those provides the end of the day report to the firm, which is sort of unheard of within the, the uh, in-house staff. If you tell them to give you a report every single day before they leave, probably half of them actually leave and don't come back. But the visual staff don't do that. They actually provide you those reports. <clears throat> so the communication needs to be very clear with those, those visual staff. You have to keep them completely on track about what is their specific responsibilities, what is their specific deliverables, and keep them accountable to that and incentivize them to be operating under those areas. And it's sort of uh, very refreshing to the firms when they actually give a specific task to someone and actually keep them accountable for that and get a deliverable based on that uh, action item. So we covered that. So the, the range of the virtual staffing that is available for the law practices, we started with the intake, and these are dedicated full-time intake staff, the bilingual, that work on the weekends, on nights, and everything, so there is completely work on the schedule you provide them. <clears throat> The second is the case manager. Basically, if you break down the work of the case manager, once the retainer is, is completed and the matter has been opened, <clears throat> right from there, you're setting up the treatment, you're contacting the insurance company, you're doing collecting the police report. These case managers are completely capable of doing that entire process. And then a lot of the firms either have the case manager or have a dedicated medical record retrieval person who collects all the medical records and puts them into your case management software. The next range of it is like, we actually have remote attorneys in about eight different countries, which work as either like a paralegal or assistant to the attorney who does everything all the way to law and motion. So they actually can do the, <coughs> write the motions, write the demands, do the discoveries. All of that has been done by them. Then you got your legal assistant, and the biggest thing right now is the demand writers. So like we saw on the chat GPT actually helping on the demands, now we actually have a subscription model to produce demand through a virtual staff or a combination of two. So you have no longer have a backlog of demands sitting and waiting for somebody to do it so you can move on to settlements. So we had that situations where law firm has 80, 100 demands that is backlogged. And if that doesn't get done properly on time, you essentially affects the cash flow for the practice. <clears throat> so we have one of the specials for this conference is that anybody who is here and registered can actually contact us and try one of these virtual staff for free for the whole month, full time, dedicated, bilingual for any task that we talked about. So if you come up by the boot, you can actually register to try one of the virtual staff for a full-time position. It's not gonna cost anything to do that. <clears throat> so we have a program called the Client Retention Program. This Client Retention Program, it takes every steps to be able to maximize the return on investment on every client that you have served before. Now there's a variety of different methods that happen to do that. So there's a custom mobile app that is made for every kind of a practice that allows them to refer the, their friends and family to you, get a case update, collect documentation, get a retainer signed, everything through a custom mobile app and it supports over 100 languages. So you can have one of those apps for your firm to completely do the client retention through your mobile app. We offer SMS marketing, which is essentially contacting your contact database to be able to wish them happy birthdays on their anniversary, case settlement anniversary, holiday greetings. Everything intention is to be on the top of the connection with the clients. Like you heard throughout the whole day today, is to make sure you're connected and you're in front of your clients. Then you got the newsletter, monthly newsletter that goes out 
they have a client advocate that actually contacts your clients right after the retainer is signed to see what was their experience actually re being retained by the firm. Then they also get contacted during the treatment to see how the experience even the case management and also all the medical providers and after the settlement. So this is basically quality control through the practice to make sure every aspect of your, uh, your workflow process and the organization has accountability. And in the end, when you're collecting the end results after the settlements, if they're very happy with the settlements, you can turn that into a very positive review or a video testimonial that you can use on your social. Uh, and basically doing a case update for them, essentially is, is to be able to keep the community of your previous clients all engaged with the firm on a continuous basis because you want to be able to get referrals from those clients. By the way, another offer, <laughs> that mobile app that I just talked about, which is customized for your law firm. If you contact our staff, you can actually have that mobile app for your practice. It's a custom design. Again, it's not gonna cost you anything. It will help you a lot with your customer client relationships, getting referrals, and automated document collection for your cases. So that's another offer. So I know that there's a lot that's been said about the marketing strategies. One thing I noticed when I was doing the, the, the consulting, nobody really had a plan. Nobody had a marketing plan, advertising plan, with the budget, with deliverables, with the ROI. Everybody basically said, well, I'm trying this thing, and I'm trying that thing. I'm doing the bus benches, or I'm doing this ad campaign on Google, but there's no actual plan. No other organizations operate that way. They actually have a marketing plan. They have somebody in charge of the marketing plan that be able to do all of the steps, measure the ROI. I mean, everybody here talked about everything that you need to be doing for your case generation, client generation, online presence, and so forth. But having the initial plan is one of the most important things because then you have, uh, have a designated budget for it and keep somebody accountable to be able to deliver what the marketing is supposed to do. So that's one of the big things. The second thing, uh, again, coming from a different environment, I was asking every one of the attorneys, what is your cost of client acquisition? Nobody knows. Everybody's guessing. I think it's 2,000. No, I heard a gentleman here saying it was 4,000, and then somebody else says it's 3,000. If you don't know how much you're buying it for, how do you know it's affordable? How do you know you have an ROI? Because you don't know. So the system that we put in place was to be able to create a cost of client acquisition in every market based on every platform. So you say my cost of client acquisition, like give you some example because we deal with so much data. PI cost of client acquisition in California averages $2,600. It used to be about $1,200. The same case in Texas is about $1,600. And in New York, it's about 1,800. Those are some real data because we collect a lot of this data from the firms that we work with. So you have to have a metrics to be able to know exactly how much you're paying for those cases. Every case other than a referral is bought. <laughs> so you gotta know how much you're buying it for. Then the second part is that how much resources you put in and the time to finish the case, and what is your average fees received and ended the case. If you don't know those three things, you can never truly evaluate how profitable you are or how efficient you are or what your ROI is. Okay. <clears throat> Referral networks. Every attorney, again, I talked to, they said, I started off with just getting all my cases through referrals. And then even somewhere down the line, even 10 years later, they're still counting on the referrals. Even referrals from other attorneys, other firms, different practice areas. But if you're counting on something that important and that valuable, how come nobody has a referral manager? Somebody who is actually, this position is also a virtual staff, who manages all your referrals and keep in touch with them. I always use this example. If somebody, every year on your birthday, 
gives you a Rolex watch as a gift, which is equal to most average PI cases in the States. Do you treat this person just like, oh yeah, I always get one or two cases from John a year, and that's great. They don't build a relationship and having a true value of that referral. The second part, the people who actually do extensive referrals, you need to be able to gauge and manage and make sure those cases are worked because they, they're your money and be able to get payment on them. One of the few things that we tested out on this management of the network, the referral network, was the ability to actually assign a virtual staff for three months, which cost about $6,000 for three months. And we had this person work on the PI network within California, which went on the attorney's LinkedIn, made the connection request to every other firm within the state. It took about three months. And then I start contacting them, letting them know that we take this kind of cases, we take dog bites, we take premise liabilities, and we provide 40% referral fees. After that three months, the law firm was actually, uh, we did this with one PI firm and one employment firm. The employment firm paused it because they got so overwhelmed with the cases coming from the referral that it said, you gotta stop, give me some time to catch up, which basically means we had to give them a bunch of more staff, virtual staff, to take care of the cases so we can go back on. Again, it comes back to being a systematic. You know, somebody full-time sitting and building your LinkedIn so you can get referrals. And on those LinkedIn connections, you're offering 40, 50% referral fees. You get a lot of referrals because there's a lot of firms don't like to touch so many different cases. You know, the high-end litigation folks, don't want to do any of the pre-lead uh, pre or the minimum policy, so they're looking for people. I have two firms in, uh, in Southern California that they refer out about 80 to 100 cases a month to about six or seven smaller law firms because it's not, their operation is not set up and it's not cost effective to do the minimum policy in California, which is 1530. I mean, it's almost impossible to make money on that. So they just refer them out, they get 40% referral fees, they don't touch a case, but now they have a referral manager, which is a virtual staff, who manages all of those outgoing and incoming. And as a result, those smaller law firms refer their litigation cases and high value cases to this other firm. So it's like win, win, win. <clears throat> so, one of the evaluations we also do in the, what we call the practice tune-up is evaluating the firm, how technology ready is the firm, how it's set up. Everybody here you know, hears it, sees it, their colleagues are doing it, but having the proper case management software configured for your law firm. A lot of folks think if I just go buy a Clio or Filevine or Casepeer or Litify or whatever, I bought it, so it should be done. I should I check that box. It's not like that. None of those things really works out of the box. <laughs> you have to spend time and resources customizing it, making it fit your culture of the firm, your processes, and so forth. The process automation. Every time I ask uh, the folks about how you process the case, or they from the lead all the way to settlement, draw up your workflow for me. Non-starter. It's like, I don't know. John gets the cases, gives it to Mary, and Mary does some things with it, and gives it to Julie, and then Julie <laughs> gets the medical records. But there is no written down, and it's not communicated to the staff. So on the bigger firms that are 50 plus you know, staff, nobody has a clear job description, workflow process. They know where the responsibility begins and where the responsibility ends, what they're accountable for, and what they, how they're passing it on. That doesn't exist. Document collection is still a big part of a practice, and there's a lot of technologies that automates document collections from the clients or lien uh, providers. <clears throat> but very few of them are set up and configured to do that. Communication system is not just a phone or voice over IP. There's a lot of new communication that's like Slack and things like that that can be utilized to optimize your process. Tracking, <clears throat> very little tracking. Like I ask, how many active cases you have? Nobody gave me the right answer. 
I think is about 370 or so. And then you go dig in, you see they have 450, or they have 250. How many of them are in pre-lead? How many of them are trading? How many of them are in settlements? How many backlog demands you have? All of those answers is like, I don't know. I think, well, let me go ask John. <laughs> so there is no tracking, there is no dashboard to be able to manage the practice. You should literally look at one dashboard from your ad spend to your settlement and see the entire picture. You know, it's like a, some people uh, labeled me as a, somebody who sets up gadget factory. I said, well, you can call it whatever you want, but it's a gadget factory as long as I know what's coming in, when it's coming, how much did it cost me, and how long did it take for me to actually get, make profit out of it, call it a gadget factory. Uh, and then lastly, AI, which <clears throat> is a much bigger topic. We already, everybody talked about that, and I have my own perspective, I will tell you about that. Um, so the AI is coming, <laughs> and you gotta find out what it's gonna do for you and to you. <clears throat> The ones that, the folks who are actually in the transactional law is gonna probably wipe out about 80% of that market. Because transactional law is like immigration, estate planning, corporate formation, everything transactional. The AI is gonna be able to do much better job than any transactional attorney because they have access to massive data, all the right answers, and this is all a bunch of forms that needs to be populated. So that's one of the first impact. <clears throat> the second part of the impact is the AI everybody talked about here was like a machine learning stuff or chat GPD. That's not how I look at it because I come from data warehousing and data mining and decision support systems. We actually created the foundation of a development for AI. <clears throat> Those days it's called data mining. <clears throat> so your entire process, imagine there's gonna be one or several AI applications who's gonna take care of, basically, finds out what platform, what demographic you need to target, how much to spend, what kind of a result to expect, create the ads, run the ads, track the ads, have the leads come in, the AI intake will do the intake on the AI, send the retainer, get the retainer back, Set up the treatments because they know all the medical providers on Lina that you're using, or you can actually bring in a whole bunch of new ones that you don't know about. <clears throat> Find all the treatments, collect the medical records, analyze them, recommendation, write the demand, send it to insurance company. I mean, that whole process is gonna be AI. Very little lowering, especially for pre-lit. When you go to the lead, there is also impact. All the discovery, paralegal sitting there and doing research. Who can do research better than AI? All the discovery is that. Looking, setting you up for depositions, what questions to ask, <clears throat> what kind of responses are the possible responses from the defense. All of that gonna begin AI. The discoveries, getting you ready for trial. Trial preparation is AI. It's gonna tell you, it's gonna analyze the judge, the judge's history, the type of the case, what kind of results has happened in the past 10 years. All that preparation is AI. <laughs> so AI is not, to me, it's not chat GPT. Chat GPT is like a Google. Like you used, I mean, you got used to it. Do a search, get a bunch of information, some relevant, some not so relevant, some old, some good, bad, it's a search. But when you go to Amazon, you order a product, you know exactly what product you want, how much you wanna pay for it, when you're gonna receive it, what's the reviews on that. That's going to be the equivalent of the chat GPDs to come. It's gonna take about three to five years to so finish up that cycle. So <clears throat> that's what I said that what's gonna do for you or what's gonna do to you <laughs> is the question here. <clears throat> I actually have a, I couldn't hold it all inside, so I actually ended up writing a book about this that is coming out that shows the impact of the AI in the different type of practice areas. And one of the things I also has about it is that I did a complete search of every AI application out there that we could find, and a brief description of it, and categorizing it into like resources, 
marketing, content generation, but these are vertical. This is not chat GPT. Probably 80% of them utilize chat GPT in some shape or format, but they're optimizing it to get you the results that you want to get. No, I just used my, <laughs> my history and experience to do it because it was like when you come from that kind of a old, uh, you know, high-tech arena, you just need to express it. So this was one way of to expressing it. Great. And that's the, the book that everybody probably has in their bags. And it was just a passion of being able to actually express my desire, my frustration, <laughs> and everything about the law practice. I'm mean, continuously putting effort to be able to do that. So let's open it up to questions and see anybody has a question that I can specifically answer. Regardless of the practice management or AI, I'll be happy to do that. Go ahead. Great question, absolutely. So it ranges between $2,000 and $2,800 a month as a full-time um, staff. So the $2,000 usually starts at the intake and the demand riders and paralegals are about $2,800. Is a, <clears throat> is a fixed cost for a full-time dedicated, and we manage, the way we manage the VAs is kind of different. Uh, we recruit them screen them, train them, and continuously manage them. So it is not like it's handed off. We continuously do development of their skill set. We capture their screen every 15 minutes. We record all the calls they make, and you have access to all of that. We track every URL they go to, and they will work in any schedule of full time that you desire. That's what's gonna be a sort of a cultural shock when actually somebody, you tell them all of this and they say, I'd be glad to work for your firm, you know, instead of like, no, I can't do that. And so they get health insurance from us, they get retirement account from us, their spouse gets the insurance from us. So the whole thing about it is to be able to keep them engaged, rewarded, and dedicated to the job. It's not a placement situation, because in average, we have about four virtual staff per firm. We work about 650 law firms and has a full range of those services. I have a, several PI firms in Los Angeles who have 35 to 48 VAs placed in one firm. And they keep basically increasing those utilization of the VAs because two things happen. Fine. One, it eliminates the scalability issue. I just ran a campaign, I just got a huge settlement, I spent a half a million dollar in ad campaign, I'm not worried about it. I get five intake VAs to take all the leads and convert them. And that's one impact. The second impact is like over time when you're dealing with in-house staff that are not up to par or they're not the same commitment and quality you want, you keep bringing your standards lower and lower and lower until you hit their level. Because you don't want to replace them. It's too hard to replace them. It's too expensive, all of that. You hire somebody for 30 bucks an hour, if you want to go to market, hire the same person, you got to offer them 45. So because of those, you compromise your standards until it gets low enough that meets that, that category. The people who experience the virtual staffing with us, they don't do that. They basically say, out, I just call legal soft and get four more. There's no long-term commitments. There is no additional cost. You can add or expand or replace or terminate at any time. So there's a lot of flexibility that is, uh, enables the firm to operate smoother and more efficient. So for about $2,000 a month full time. And that whole client retention things that I talked to you about, the mobile app, the SMS, the newsletter, the website maintenance, the social media, all of those services combined is less than $2,500 a month. And you get the full category of a wish list of things that you wanted to do. Everything that I mentioned on a monthly basis is less than 2,500. So this is what outsourcing uh, brings you that is affordable. You don't have to pay 2,000 here and 1,000 for social media and 1,000 dollars for newsletter and 1,000 dollars for mobile app, nothing like that. All combined is affordable that way. Look, 
Uh, I, is there, I mean, is there, would you mind repeating that question so everybody can hear it? Sure. Thank you. Um, the gentleman was asking about the English skill set and communication skill with the English language. You get presented with several candidates that you interview just like you would interview your local candidates. And you s see how they talk, what they say, uh, how much accent they have, and all of that before you're selecting them. So if you don't find your match, there's five more behind it that's going to come until it is. But through the years, for the past five, seven years, we all got custom to the bit of accent like mine. I've been here almost all my life. I went to high school in Lafayette, Louisiana when I was 13. So <laughs> uh, I still have an accent. It's not going to go away. But through working with all of these bigger companies, American Express, you know, Chase Bank, everywhere. Every time you pick up a phone, somebody on the other side has an accent. In the beginning, it was like, oh my God, I gotta talk you slowly, I gotta this. Now we don't care because it's not a whole lot of choices. They're all using virtual staffing. So as a, a community, as a generation, we learn to deal with a bit of accent and make it be okay because they also happen to be more courteous, nicer, more uh, patient, so it sort of trades off. <laughs> Any other questions? Where do you suggest someone starts? Like what would be the first recommended hire that you have access to first? Number one has always been intake. The question is uh, what's the most feasible position to start with the visual staff? There's two categories. Either getting a legal assistant that does everything that you shouldn't be doing and your paralegal and a case manager shouldn't be doing. Like contacting the client, following up with the treatment, collecting the medical records. So the legal assistant is the first place that you do that and then they're very versatile and they never tell you it's not my job or I didn't get hired to do this or why you ask me to do that is never ever, ever like that. So they do exactly what you ask them to do and they're grateful. So. That is first one. For the firms that are investing any amount of money generating leads, which you're paying for all those leads, which is very expensive, having a dedicated full-time bilingual intake staff is a must because otherwise you're throwing your money away. You're paying all this money to generate leads through your SEO, through your website, through email, through Google, through social media, but there's nobody on the other side trying to convert it. So you just think, that because I spend the money, I should get a case. No, you need to have a dedicated staff who's going to continuously contact and email those leads, follow up with them, send them a retainer, and get a sign back. So that's a, probably the biggest ROI is your intake staff. Medical record is the third one because nobody in the firm likes to do it, basically. Everybody complains. It's like... I called Dr. John and three times and I still don't have the records. I don't really want to call him again. Can you call him? So you, pick, give, him, you give one of your case managers to do a, a medical record collection and he passes right back at you. So if you don't have that, you can't do demands. If you don't do demands, there's no settlements. There's no settlements, there's no money. So that's where you need that one person. They say, I want these 20 cases all the documents collected before end of the month because I'm going to go to demand and settlements right after that. Excellent. Hamid, I think we have time for at least one more question right back here. To your left. Ah, go ahead, please. Yes, we actually developed this, well, I'm glad you asked that. We developed this platform called uh, Practice 360. So when we started doing these individual services, we noticed that there's a lot of communication happening through email, like put this on my newsletter, put this on my social, send this SMS out, or post this survey. So there was like a, hundreds of emails going back and forth. So we created a platform where all of this communication happens in there, all the tracking and display of a dashboard and the leads is in there. So you know if you're using seven different lead generation platform, we track them all in this platform. We tell you how much you paid for the leads, 
how many percent of leads got converted to the case, what's the cause of client acquisition from Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, website, all of that. So that's a dashboard. It's the closest thing to what I mentioned in the beginning that you need to manage the practice via the dashboard. You can go around, look for data, ask for data, try to run a report. It needs to be in the dashboard format. And that's the goal we have. And within this dashboard, you also manage all your virtual staffing, all the tasks assigned to them, uh, communication with them, see their timesheets, paying for their invoices. Everything is done in the one platform 360. Excellent. Excellent. Let's put our hands together for Hamid. Thank you, everyone. Great job.